Tired of chaotic business travel bookings? Corporate Traveler has your back. With over 30 years of experience, unmatched service, and 24-7 support, we'll help you take the hassle out of business travel management. Plus, tap into exclusive corporate rates to keep your costs down. No more last-minute change headaches or cost surprises. Just smooth, efficient business travel experiences. Visit corporatetraveler.ca and discover refreshing business travel the Corporate Traveler way. Blog Talk Radio. Thanks for listening, everybody, and I'm going to bring in Paula Harris right now. I'm your host, Jason Pepper, once again, and uh, without further ado, here's my special guest, Paula Harris. Hello, Paula. How are you tonight? Uh, good. I'm I'm doing fine. Uh, I'm calling you. I'm calling you on myself. Can I? Is there any way that I could switch over to my landline? Uh, it, you can absolutely call back in if you want. Uh, uh, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, if you want to phone back, I can put uh, the show on a temporary hold, and uh, we can have you back within a minute if you like. Yeah, because because first of all, I thought you were going to call me because I uh, calling in long distance. So yes. I, I would love to to call. If I have to call, I'd like to call on my landline. No problem. Okay, so that's exactly what we'll okay. do. Uh, we'll just put the show on a temporary hold, and uh, we'll talk to you in a, in a very short amount of time. I'll call you right back. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye bye. (laughs) Okay, everybody. So just uh, hang tight. Uh, She's going to call right back in. Uh, I hope everyone had a great day. And uh, thanks to everybody that's in the chat room for listening tonight. Uh, Appreciate it. And everyone that might be listening on archives or other areas, uh, such as my website or YouTube or whatnot, thanks for the support as well. And. Check out the article I wrote today in uh, the Facebook group. It's uh, about this weird pentagram or pentagon shape that was uh, photographed over the mountains of Argentina uh, from an airplane. 
It's bizarre. I don't know what it is. Uh, actually going to ask uh, Paula if she knows or has seen that. And uh, what else is big? Uh, I posted a few interesting commercial videos, uh, and uh, I can take a look at those as well. Okay, here's Paula again, so we'll bring her in. Hello once again. How are you tonight? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm calling you from Boulder, Colorado. I'm doing yes, absolutely indeed. fine. Um, and I, as usual, <laughs> I'm, I'm working uh, a lot uh, on, on different things, and uh, yes, so happy to talk to you. Well, it's an absolute uh, honor, and uh, I'm mesmerized. I mean, the, the fact that I get to speak to people such as yourself and others that uh, I've been watching and, and following on, you know, television programs, YouTube, newspapers, etc. Uh, every time I speak to a person of your caliber, uh, it just blows my mind. And, and I'm more than honored to have you on, and I want to say thanks so much. Well, thanks, Jason. The thing is that we're just doing a job. I mean, I just feel that way. I'm just doing a job. And since I'm an educator, basically, I'm educating. And my particular job, and I'm always kidding around when I say this, is like I'm the Barbara Walters of ufology. I just <laughs> interview people, you know. I mean, it's like I, I basically, my books are all interviews word for word of military, um, intelligence people, people that I've worked on on projects having to do with UFOs. And, and then sometimes I get... Uh, really an honor of, of talking to an astronaut like Dr. Edgar Mitchell. And, and of course, my biggest story recently is Paul Hallier, ex-Canadian uh, Defense Minister, because I flew to Toronto and I did a high-definition video of, of him because he's got a brand-new book out. That's absolutely true. And uh, I posted that in the, the Facebook group. Uh, I'll also post it in the chat room for those that have not seen that. And uh, it's quite an interview, and uh, he covers a lot of material. Uh, one, one of the things I wanted to get uh, or ask you from your impression, because he made a statement before of humans not to, to meddle in space uh, because it may cause uh, intergalactic war. Uh, does he still feel that way off the record or even on the record? Well, the problem is that I think we're already shooting at them. I mean, uh, uh, we're not exactly having war, but one of my interviews, uh, Milton Torres, who was a pilot in 1957 and was ordered to shoot at a UFO and did have it on lock, lock uh, on his plane. Um, it, and the only reason he could talk about it was because uh, uh, the Ministry of Defense in Great Britain released the files, and here's an American serviceman. But after many years in his 80s, can talk about the fact that we're shooting down UFOs. Now, now if you're, you know, logically, if this happened in 1957, can you imagine what we might be doing today with the, you know, the high uh, scalar weapons we have now, the SBI kind of stuff? Um, right. The only thing is, I don't think that we, you know, I think that they're probably very, very sophisticated and have sophisticated technologies who are maybe but we look like a very hostile race if we're ordering people to shoot them down and I think Paul knows that and he he's basically looking at I think Paul's big focus uh, like Stephen Greer's is uh, the release of the um, uh, of the technologies of the especially the energy technologies uh, the zero port energy, the the you know electromagnetic energy technologies, whatever we've back engineered, whatever we have had since Roswell, you know whatever we have on hold until the fossil fuel age goes you know goes past us, uh, he would like the release of that. I think that's the real reason that both Stephen Greer and Paul Hellyer uh, want want to talk about this. I don't think it's about the aliens or who's inside or who's driving these, you know, craft, because I think right. Paul feels like they're pretty benign. Otherwise, we would have had a space war. We would have had aggression. We certainly have had a lot of these UFOs over our missile silos, uh, the shutdown of the missiles at Maelstrom Air Force Base, the Rendlesham Forest Bentwaters case that had a nuclear facility there. I mean, a lot of, of these uh, craft are over nuclear facilities. If they wanted to do something, they would have done it, I think, a long time ago. That's true. That's very true. And, uh, you know, the fact that uh, they can easily travel within uh, our realm uh, or even our planet, you know, uh, I think if they want, as you said, they can 
decimate us within a blink of an eye. So and it hasn't happened yet. No, I, I, I don't think that's their their agenda. I think their agenda is to say that the way we're living on this planet, destroying our resources, killing each other, not being a real evolved race, a species, uh, is not really the way to go for the future. And I think that they appear in the skies to kind of give a message. You know, it's like the, not, the directive of, of non-interference with a very primitive culture. And I think we're a primitive culture, and they're just saying, here we are, or we're, we're going to fly over and show you we exist. I mean, are you going to wake up, or are you going to keep doing the stuff you're doing? And, um, you know, that's just basically my job is to get these testimonies, not so much the sightings, but the people that have worked in these projects, in these programs, uh, people that have had, you know, uh, you know, some kind of military involvement with these craft. And then... You know, just recently, within the last five years, I've started talking to some contactees. That's a, a great point, too, and we'll cover that uh, in the, a little bit. Uh, I just had Stanton Friedman on, and uh, you, you, you're well aware of his uh, issues with Bob Lazar. Uh, do you have those same issues? Uh, and no, no, I don't have any issues with Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar is real. Uh, and Bob Lazar is real. Everybody in Europe knows Bob Lazar is real. Bob... I've talked to Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar is sick and tired of of uh, of all this kind of debunking. He basically did work there. He has uh, there are papers that show that he did have uh, you know some. Uh, I think he has a W two form for working there. He is now doing his own thing in the same kind of area, and uh, you know I, I'm a lot of us, especially people in Europe truly know that he would have no other intent or reason to make up something, plus the fact that he uh, he did discover element, um, I think it's, is it 114 or 115, that, yes. that uh, the element that was, that was, you know, discovered years later. Yes. Well, there's a lot of people like Bob Lazar, though. I mean, there's a lot of whistleblowers that I don't think are making up stuff that were inside, uh, are insiders, that want to disclose, but unfortunately we're our own worst enemies for debunking our own people. And I think that one of the cases here is the case of Colonel Philip Corso, and he was my biggest case. I, I brought Corso to Italy, and here's a man who worked in the Pentagon, who worked on research and development, who was the head of intelligence in Rome. He was the head of the CIC, the early intelligence agencies, and this man is not lying at 80 uh, at 82 years old, when he came out with the day after Roswell, and here in his, in our country, people tend to criticize, debunk, and try to take him apart. And and uh, you know, and, and he said to me, <laughs> it was really funny. He just said, "Look, you know, don't pass your stupidity on to me. I'm sick of the debunkers and critics. Where were they? I was working in the Pentagon. I was working on this stuff." He yeah. said it was given to me by General Trudeau. This was my job. I put this stuff uh, into the, uh, you know, into uh, modern companies. He talked about Bell Labs. Now, the argument is, and Jason, I have to tell you this, the argument is that it was already in the mainstream. And it's true. I mean, because I think, this is my theory, that when these crashes happened in 1945, the Army and the Air Force were together. It was Army Air Force. And it was in 48 that they split up. So, you know, you have a crash in 47, they split up in 48. Well, maybe some of those Air Force guys got some of this stuff and started working on it way back when. And Colonel Corso, if you listen to what he has to say, basically says, I went to the companies that were already working in those directions and gave them the contracts. So they were already working in that direction, in the direction of the laser, the fiber optics, the integrated circuit. There is no reason this man would ever lie, and the reason he told me he came out with the truth, which was extremely dangerous for him, was that he had three grandchildren, that he wanted to leave a legacy of truth to them. And so as a journalist, and I think people should think about this, is the reason why people tell, especially at that age, is because they want to tell the truth, and it's extremely courageous of them. And I think it's sad when we have our own people debunking uh, you know, these courageous people, especially when they're dead and they can't defend themselves. Absolutely. And uh, why is that? Why do you think there's such a, a struggle for 
truth? Is it to keep the information diluted and, and, and confused so that uh, the truth doesn't surface? Well, see, I, I don't publicly do that. I don't go publicly and debunk anybody. I, I can't even understand why somebody would do that. Um, I think the reason is because, there, first of all, there's a whole bunch of Roswell people, uh, and, and you know, the, the people are interested in Roswell. Sometimes it's a competition. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just that, uh, you know, they, it's, people really believe that. I mean, I don't know. It depends on who says it. it it's yeah. a heavy responsibility. And I really, I really believe that what people should be doing, Jason, is doing great research and leave other people alone. Uh, and and do their own great research because we have so many amazing uh, people in the field. And Stanton is one of them. I mean, we owe a lot to him. He is a, one of the most credible researchers in the world. Uh, he's a, the icon of ufology. However, you know, there's the, that other side where you know, you, it, it, I wonder why it happens. You know, I stand there in awe of the fact that we could take apart our own people. And that, you know, nobody believes in the Billy Meyer case, for instance, and, and that is real. Um, I lived in Europe for 15 years, and I went to Schmidt Rudy, and I saw that situation. Plus, I have documents that were given to a German scientist from NASA itself who knew the Billy Meyer case was real. Right. But the problem with things like the Billy, you, you wonder why we have to take that apart. Well, because those were human-type aliens. And we have a brainwashing in the United States that it has to be the little gray. There's nothing else out there. So, you know, you scares the living daylights out of everybody. We, we think the little gray abduction situation is the only alien. Well, in the last four years, if people read especially my last book, they'll see that I've done some cases where there's human-type aliens so much so that they can't tell the difference between the human and the alien. And this is something Colonel Corso told me personally that the Pentagon was terrified of because he said some of these people could look like us and they're walking in the halls of the Pentagon. That's a very good point, and uh, the camouflage factor is something that may alarm the majority of the population. Uh, is that one of the reasons they may suppress it? Well, yeah, you've got a situation with, with Billy Meyer where there's a, a father and daughter who look, you know, human, and they're giving messages about the, you know, about, uh, you know, the the realities of of spirituality on Earth and where they come from and uh, the fa how Earth is looked at in the galaxy and so forth. And, uh, you know, and, and they meet with Billy, who was prepared for this at, from his youth because he he went to India. He had some experiences. Usually these kind of contactees have some kind of spiritual background, and, and they, they pick people. Aliens, I think, pick people they can talk to, pick people who see the whole entire picture. Uh, and so, you know, the, the thing that then, then we have half the world like, debunking this. And I'm going, did you ever bother going there? Did you ever talk to him? Did you ever see, uh, you know, the situation? Did you ever talk to Wendell Stevens, who... I respect immensely is one of the best researchers in the world, and he covered that that whole case. Lived with Billy, uh, so you know there's just so much. I, I would, I really encourage people to read everything, read everything, and make up their own minds. Nobody should be dictating what we think. Absolutely, such a great point. And uh, you mentioned Europe. Uh, I, I want to let the listeners know uh, there there's, seems to be an absolute difference of opinion from Europe to North America with, when it comes to uh, ufology. Uh, they're more accepting and open about it. And uh, is that the sense that, that you gained from that as well? Well, you know, what it is, it's not commercial. Now, you know, here, you know, uh, <laughs> they, they can't help it. America has T-shirts and little goggles and magnets and all that kind of stuff. When you go to a conference in Europe, you, you go to a symposium, and it's usually scientists that are sitting around gabbing and talking. Or, you know, I brought a lot of your ufologists to Europe. I, I brought uh, John Mack, uh, Je uh, Jesse Marcel Jr., Ryan Wood, Richard Dolan, um, uh, just a lot of different people. Uh, Linda Howe, I mean, I have helped bring these people to Europe, and they are very well respected there. And, and so people sit around, and, they, and they, it's a scholarly kind of atmosphere. It's not a carnival. 
it's not it's so everybody's curious and so they want to hear what you have to say and and then they discuss it and it's like more like a symposium or a scholarly atmosphere there's scientists and astronomers and just curious people and right. but here when you have a conference it's like I think that it's more of a entertainment event, and and you see a lot of the same people, and they're they're like preaching to the choir. They already know there's UFOs. To get out into the mainstream in America is very difficult. Some of these cases should be covered on mainstream media. I mean the the newest, and you saw it. The news story is that Churchill uh, yeah. was a worried. Well, why didn't you get get on CNN? I mean, you know, Churchill is a major personage. Why why doesn't that get on CNN? Why doesn't some of this uh you know the the O'Hare case where the UFO was over O'Hare Airport? That did get on CNN. That got a lot of attention it, especially from the Chicago Tribune. And then everybody forgot about it. And so, you know, one of the things is that the mainstream media has a problem with covering this. Larry King did a lot for a while. He did he did an awful lot, thanks to James Fox, you know, the, the producer of Out of the Blue. And he got people like, you know, by signing to the governor, uh, you know, of Arizona. My God, it is, he got astronauts. They got Robert Solis. They got really top-level people to talk. And then it, it just kind of goes away. We, You know, the, the media just sort of lets it go. And I think it's also the people that kind of let it go. Uh, you know, if you really want disclosure as Stephen Bassett you know passionately says we got to have the people want it the people have to demand it and and I don't know if you know about the Denver initiative we have Jeff Peckman here in Denver who <laughs> he, he got enough signatures so that it's on the Denver ballot in I think in November and if nothing else at least it, it's in the minds of the people it's going to get looked at it's going to get covered it's going to get dealt with, and that's what, what we journalists and we people that want disclosure hope it happens. Absolutely, and uh, do you feel that there will be, uh, I, I asked this to Stephen Bassett, and he's not even sure, but uh, do you think there will be a European disclosure before uh, U.S. or even North American disclosure? Well, I think there is disclosure. I mean, it depends if you're paying attention. When the MOD in in England is releasing all its file thousands of pages and releasing names like they did in Milton Torres. When France does the Cometa report and suggests the United States come clean and talks about its pilots that have had near collisions with these UFOs, when most of the countries, including Brazil, the you know the military in Brazil, came out with files, disclosure is happening. It's happening. It's not going to come from the President of the United States saying, hey, guess what, there are UFOs. It's a given because the disclosures are coming from military sources who are worried about national security issues. I mean, it's no fun to have a mid-air cra crash. If you're a, com uh, a commercial airliner the way Jean-Jacques Dubrock was, and, and I interviewed him, and you see the UFO and you've got passengers in the back, I don't think there's anything funny about that. And I certainly don't think... We should be making light of it. And and the thing is that, that it's happening already. It's just how you define disclosure. The president's certainly not going to announce it uh, because he's got enough on his plate. I mean, people that are really interested are, are, are probably meeting in the back rooms talking about it. I'm sure that somewhere in the United Nations back room they, they cover it. I know in Japan and China they're covering it. So, But it's just that in the general public, they don't want to. They probably don't want to <laughs> to cause a major disturbance and and you know get into the general public. However, there's so many people talking about it. You're absolutely right. In fact, there's a, a fire station. Uh, I forget exactly where, but uh, uh, they created a manual in case of a, a UFO landing uh, as part of their. Uh, yeah, that's emergency. the SOM 101 manual. I mean, I think that's. Oh, or maybe it's the other one. There are two. There are two manuals. But this yes. was done a long time ago because we've had a lot of crashes. I recommend one of the books people should read is, is Majestic Twelve or Magic Twelve, written by Ryan Wood. It has over a hundred crashes all over the world that he's done incredible research on. Um, and it's not. And, and then everybody will say, "Well, you know, how come they crash?" Well, this isn't so much malfunctions. I don't think they're malfunctions. I think. 
that that you know th- there are conditions whether meteorological or shoot downs where where these craft in other countries and here crash and i think that uh you know that a long time ago i mean if you consider how long ago roswell was 47 and i think there were three crashes in that area uh you know that they've had like 60 years 60 years to figure out what to do somebody is working on this i just posted a, a video in the chat room uh, of uh, a gentleman in italy actually and uh a lot of people feel he's the next Billy Meyer. His name is Antonio Ursi. Uh, oh, yeah, I know Antonio. He's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Incredible> <laughs> well, Antonio, let me tell you about Antonio. But I think Antonio, I think they gravitate towards him. He's such a, a pure <laughs> being. He's so, he's so fun. He's basically a pure human being. And right. uh, I was with him in Mexico City because we were at a conference Jaime Malsan hosted and awarded us, it was Michael Sala, Don Schmidt, um, A.J. Gevard, Antonio Uzi, uh, Nick Pope. We were all there in March. And I said to Antonio, we were in the hotel, I said, don't you dare go out without me, because everywhere you go, you you film UFOs. I mean, so I I walked out with him out of the hotel, and he made me stop in the middle of the street, and we looked up. And I was there for over an hour and a half with my own camera. And it was on. It's on my website. I took pictures of the UFO, uh, the the orb that just kept flitting right in the sky in front of us. And then the Mexican television came out, and they started filming it too. So I mean, everywhere Antonio goes, so he just looks. Up, but he can catch him. I mean, he looks up in the sky. He points them out, which I would have never seen if he hadn't pointed them out. And we watched that thing just zigzag all over the place for over an hour. And when you see a craft like that, uh, it, how do you feel? Because I've seen some strange stuff myself, and uh, I feel at peace, like I'm not even afraid. Is that a feeling that you get as well? Well, actually, I'm very curious. I, I look, and I, I wish, you, you know, you feel really bad when it goes away and you don't see it anymore. Um, but it sort of, like, just blinks out. I can't even explain it. But uh, that that was that that was a daylight sighting, but I've had a much uh, more powerful sighting in northern Italy uh, off of a balcony of this lady's house with three craft that came in and did a complete show. And they they, they did back and forth and up and down, and one was getting really close to the ground, which lit up the whole entire ground. Uh, And this happens a lot in this one place. And and I, I felt like I just never wanted them to go away. I loved watching the whole thing. But, you know, I've done work in this area for 30 years, and I, what I love to do is actually meet somebody that's inside. I mean, uh, what was happening was like a show for us, and, and it was, a, you know, harmless and, and a show, but, you know, I, it would be great. And I'm working in the area of exopolitics, Jason, and if I can really define it for your listeners, I'd like to do that. Uh, yeah. I, I went from ufology to exopolitics, and for me, exopolitics, is the um, formal study of the extraterrestrial presence and its sociological as well as political implications for the planet. So I'm past the sighting stage. I would like to get to the nitty-gritty and, and try to work out something for contact, formal contact with these people. And uh, that's why, you know, I'm really passionate about the exopolitical field. And I want to add, Jason, that I teach online classes for Dr. Michael Salas. Uh, Exopolitics Institute, and right now I'm teaching be- best witness testimony of the best witnesses I- I've talked to, and next uh, fall I'm teaching the role of Hollywood in disclosure, because Hollywood was very much contacted and very much uh, drafted into trying to make some disclosure films. Yes, yes, I've always felt that as well, and uh, these, these courses that you teach, are they accessible through your website? Yeah, you, they can go to my website, and, they'll, and it'll go, take it right to the Exopolitics Institute, Dr. Michael Sala, and he gives an Exopolitics certificate. And, of course, I've written two books in Exopolitics, on Exopolitics. One is called How Do You Speak to a Ball of Light, and it talks about orbs. And the other one is called All the Above, Exopolitics All the Above, dedicated to George Nury at Coast to Coast, because he's always asking me if it's interplanetary, inter 
interstellar, interdimensional, paranormal, and I always answer, it's all of it. It's like these things are not just coming from here to there. They're in another dimension. It's, 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 it's just all of it. It needs to be studied thoroughly without the giggle factor, without people thinking it's funny. Uh, it's, right. it's, you know, it, it's really interesting. I mean, anybody who's intelligent should be curious. And it's actually one of the questions that I had for you as well. Uh, where do you see exopolitics in the next decade? Uh, you know, well, you know, our, the exopolitics in the United States is, is basically uh, uh, Stephen Bassett's ex-conference. I mean, he does a great job in Washington, D.C., but it's, I, I formed an exopolitics group in Europe, and we had a conference in Barcelona, Spain uh, last year, this time last year, and uh, 1,400 people attended. And at that conference, there were people from all over Europe, from Finland, there was Ollie from Finland, there was David from the UK, Robert Fleischer from Germany, there was a Frederick Udall from um, Denmark who had given a copy of Out of the Blue to all the Danish Parliament. That's activism. And those guys in Europe are really, really, really active in exopolitics. My book's been translated into Italian. It's called Ezopolitica. It's in Italy, so people are really interested there. But, you know, here... I don't know what to say. Uh, unless unless people start studying what's really going on, uh, we're, we may remain at the sighting stage. You know, we're way past just sightings. Well, that's the thing. Is the, the whole global community needs to come together and, and see on the same level. You know, uh, these little infightings, as we mentioned in the beginning of the show, and even large factions stepping on other uh, people, uh, I think that's what's holding it back. And uh, I, I know... Progress is slow in some cases with humanity, but uh, this is one area that really needs to be looked at. You know, it's, it's such an important issue, uh, the fact that uh, we're not alone in the universe, and uh, on the grand scale of things, we are such a small speck, and we have to be aware of that. Yeah, Jason, and I think people need to decide for themselves. Like, I have real faith in human humanity. They can read stuff that isn't really, you know, they, they know the difference. I mean, they don't need one of us to tell them what the truth is. You know, my my job, that's why in my books I just put what people say black and white. I mean, I have the audio tapes. I have the conversations. And, and the, people can decide what the person is saying. And if you do a lot of reading and a lot of studying, you can really figure it out. I mean, it's a matter of connecting the dots. And none of us in the ufological, uh, you know, uh, world should be telling people what to think. They should be figuring it out for themselves. They're very, very intelligent. Uh, well, I have a question for uh, from the chat room from uh, Osa Real. And uh, they want to know uh, what your views on Pop Fritz's work on biophotons and coherent photons, light emissions from the body, etc. I, didn't, I, I don't know, and I can't answer to that. I wish I could answer. But all I can tell you is that, that I, uh, the, only, the only kind of quantum physics or quantum mechanics that I really, uh, you know, have talked about, and, and because I've talked to different people who are involved in it, is the non-locality entanglement theory in, in, uh, uh, you know, in, um, in quantum physics. And that, that is the, the idea that when you stimulate one particle on one side of the world, the other... On the other side of the world, the other particle reacts, which means there's a connectiveness to everything that goes on. Uh, if there's a connectedness to the whole universe, then we're missing out on it because we spend too much time looking at the separations. And that's kind of a metaphysical type uh, theory. But that particular, what they asked me, I can't answer because I just don't know. No problem. Well, back on to uh, the, the exopolitics uh with all the communication that happens, you know, with people and groups that are on top of things, uh, is there information to how many crafts that are seen uh, are actually ours? Oh, boy. That's <laughs> you've you, you been doing your homework. I, yeah. On my book, in my book, All the Above, I've got the nine protocols. And, like, uh, number one, is it our stuff or their stuff? <laughs> Because uh, it gets to be really, really tricky because I really do believe that out of the Area 51 base, there's some very sophisticated technology that is not theirs. Um, uh, there is a film that I used to show from the Aviano base in Italy 
of an incredible UFO really close up coming out of the forest. It does a little turn, a little show in broad daylight, and then it goes off at warp speed. Well, it's done over an, an, uh, a NATO base. I don't think, and, and the photographer is there with a tripod, so I don't think the aliens gave him an appointment to do a show. I think that's our stuff that's being tested. And the photographer is probably a military photographer. He was supposed to be there and watch it. And everybody wishes it was a UFO from outer space, but it's definitely our stuff. And um, so, yeah, that gets tricky. But that's one of the protocols I talk about uh, in, um, in in my book. And also the fact that, you know, if there is an alien situation, you don't go up and shake hands or touch him because, like the Virginia case in Brazil, we had the death of a military policeman because he took the little creature and put it on, on his lap, and he died two weeks later. Well, you can't tell the family of this man that that aliens don't exist. That's exactly what happened. There's testimony, and Dr. Roger Lear has written a book about this called uh, The Surgeon and the Scalpel. So that's another protocol. You just you have to be careful when you're in contact with with some of these people. And as far as uh, the, the bodies at uh, Roswell, uh, with your information and your connections, was there, I believe it was seven uh, corpses. I, I might be wrong on that, but was there any corpses, uh, you know, confirmed, or is it still very speculative and uh, sort of a push on the rug type deal? No, no. If you read Colonel Corso, first of all, I really recommend everybody – uh, subscribe to Open Minds magazine. Uh, that's a, that's an incredible UFO magazine. Now on their website, there's Corso's new book, Dawn of a New Age, and and it was it wasn't a new book. It was his handwritten notes that are absolutely accurate because there's some inaccuracies in the day after Roswell, uh, because that was also go, you know it was it was co-written with Bill Burns, and the thing is that that Corso talks about having seen the autopsies. There were six. But of that particular, of course, I also saw the body, I saw uh, a couple of bodies at Fort Riley, Kansas, of a shipment that was being, you know, uh, going across the country. And people say, well, you know, the bodies were flown to Wright Patterson. Well, who knows which ones he saw? Because there were two crashes. There wasn't just one. Uh, and so, you know, we've got different stories because. That particular incident is around the the you know the uh, testing of the atomic bomb in that area. I I think they had very heavy radar that used to bring these things down, and the corpses, according to uh, Corso and a lot of other people who are still alive in Roswell, were flown to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And in Corso's case, because he saw one at Fort Riley, Kansas, some of the cargo went by land. So you, we've got witnesses that are still alive that, that are talking about this. Yes, there were corpses, and they, according to Corso, they're extraterrestrial biological entities, which means they're little clones. They weren't people. It's the people that made those little clones that we need to wonder who they are, because if they're those kind of beings, they probably were created to to fly in space. Something we can't do. Uh, it, you know, we have all kinds. Colonel uh, uh, Clifford Stone, who's another witness, you know, he worked in the military. He cleaned up, uh, cra uh, he was in crash retrieval. He said that there were 57 different races. Colonel Corso said, too, uh, categorized in the Pentagon. So we got 57 different kinds of people. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, the reason why I ask is because uh, even to this day, it's still quite a hot topic. Uh, there was a video uh, posted on YouTube of, of an apparent uh, gray alien interview. Now, it could be fake. You know, it most likely is. Who knows? But uh, my question is, are there hybrids of this uh, particular crash situation walking amongst us, in your opinion? I don't think there's hybrids of a crash situation. I think that the, the people, you know, that were involved with the abductions, you know, and there were abductions. I, you know, what? if people want to read something really amazing, read the Stan Romanak case. I mean, I think that's the new Billy Meyer. He's got more film footage and photographs than, than anybody right now as far as his own case. And he's very humble about it. I mean, uh, but I think that whatever the contact or abduction situation, whatever the program was for that, it seemed to be a program of hybridization of some kind. 
Right. And I don't think it comes from crashes. I think it comes from programming to do it, to do this. But I'm going to add another thing, Jason, that when I talked to Dr. John Mack some years ago, he thought that that program had ended, he said, because most people that were getting contacted today were getting direct downloads. In other words, they didn't have to be taken up. In other words, you could be sitting in a chair and get ideas, inspirations, and visions without having been, to be abducted. So I think that the that program could have ended a while ago. That's a good point, Then uh, A lot of people sort of poo-poo that issue of, of channelers and contactee uh, through that various type, that uh, exact method that you just mentioned. And uh, these people obviously are experiencing something that is real to them as well. And they definitely, in my opinion, deserve the credit and the time to be heard. Well, I can just tell you one quick story, which really blew me away. I interviewed in Italy. I interviewed the uh, the partner and the uh, co-worker with Marconi, you know, who worked on the radio, and he was a contemporary of Edison and Tesla. And that man was 93 years old, and he told me they had had contact, and that a lot of Marconi's uh, creations came from uh, suggestions from these people. And downloads from these people. I mean, he wasn't channeling anything. I mean, some of these uh, really intelligent uh, scientists are getting some ideas. And maybe the reason they're getting these ideas is to try to save this race, try to save this species, to try to make things better because things are not too cool on this planet. That's right. Absolutely true. And uh, if you look at it as well, it, it may be a filtration system to try to remove the aggressive you know, uh, almost destructive tendencies that humanity has. Well, it's, you know, uh, Jason, you know, it's not only that, it's about money. I think that when we finish the oil uh, petroleum age, and it's going to come to an end, I mean, look at the Gulf spill. If that didn't give anybody any ideas, I don't know what will. But, you know, when this comes to an end, we've got to have in the back burner another kind of energy. Right. And I think that whoever is working on this energy that has had it for a long time uh, is probably trying to figure out how they can make us pay for it and how it can be commercialized. But whatever that energy is, it's not going to pollute and destroy this planet. Uh, we will leave nothing for our, for our children. We'll leave nothing for our, our grandchildren if we keep living like this. And I think that's one of the messages that these beings are trying to get into our heads. And this is something that Paul Hellyer, ex-defense minister, uh, alluded to also. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you on the flip side of this, is there any aspect or you know, uh, concept in ufology that you feel is not accurate or is uh, even untrue in, in a lot of cases? Yeah, the good and bad aliens. I have, I have a, in my book... Uh, a chapter called Alien Racism. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know who's good and bad. Uh, you know, I don't know what their agenda is. I don't know if their agenda is survival. I don't know if their agenda is just to enlighten humans. I don't know what their agenda is. But we tend to, you know, we have good and bad people. And we, we've, through uh, religious beliefs, have, have labeled everybody good and bad. And, and we have a terrible problem with racism on this planet. Can you imagine if we had, like, beings that look so different from us coming down and trying to make contact with us? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, let me ask you, because uh, I asked uh, Stanton Friedman, and uh, he's not too sure. He actually said that uh, crop circles are in his gray bag. Uh, what's your stance on crop circles? Uh, in my opinion, I feel that they're, you know, not all of them are, are real, but the ones that are absolutely mind-blowing and are proven to be something other than, you know, guys on board. Uh, I feel it's a message. Uh, if what it is trying to tell us, I don't know, you know, or maybe we're missing the bigger picture. Is that something that you feel as well? Well, you know, my, my modus operandi is if I'm not covering it, if I'm out there in person and I go everywhere in person to cover stories, I yes. can't make a judgment on it. I really can't. However, right. I can tell you this, that, that uh, some of them are man-made. I know the people who make them, and some of them are not. I think Arecibo Reply was not. I think Crabwood, that had the digital disc that said, beware of false bearers of, of, uh, you know, of lies and so forth. I don't think that was made by, by humans. 
I think that uh, I've talked to people also that make them, and they say that um, that they get the inspiration of the symbol. That the symbol itself is what wakes up human consciousness, and it's it's a wake up call of human consciousness. So. In other words, that's the way, it's like waving a flag. It's like, you know, wake up and, and it does something to your psyche. So, and, and that's like the rationalization for the ones that aren't, you know, made by something else. Uh, so I'm listening to them. I'm listening to them. And I think that you can't throw away any part of this phenomenon, whether it be crop circles or whether it be cattle mutilations or whether it be abductions or whether it be sightings, it's all part of it. And if you're scholarly and you study this, you've got to study all of it. Uh, I haven't, you know, I would love to be able to finance to go there, but I do, the job I do is, is field research and I have to pay for it out of my own pocket. Just right. the interview that I did with Paul Hellyer cost over a thousand dollars. I mean, there is no sponsor for this. I have to do this all out of my own pocket and, 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 uh, you know, any story I do. So, it, you know, there's no support in this field for this kind of research, and that's darn sad. That is very sad. And, you know, and it, it just makes it that much more special, though, uh, for you to be this committed to uh, uncover the truth and, you know, bring this story, uh, and these type of stories, to light for people to read and absorb and enjoy. Because without well, that, I, there would be no... I hope they do read it, and I hope they... They see the the interview with Paul Hallier, and they see the interview with Jeff Peckman, and because those are videos, and and they do put it all together. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, let me ask you personally, what is your favorite uh, interview of all time that you've done to this point? Oh Lord, <laughs> there's so much. There's so many of them. I I just. Uh, well, he was in Italy, and and uh, it was a story, and it's in my it's in my last book. It's called Mass Contacts. It talks about a group of aliens who lived on the Pescara Adriatic coast in the nine in 1956, and what they did they were over 10 feet tall, and they, what they did was make a deal with the uh, people of this town. That in, uh, these people have the, uh, provided their needs. In other words, they had them housed in a villa. Uh, they, were, uh, they were vegetarians, so they had fruit and vegetables brought in for them to eat. And these were people. They, they were regular people. And this experiment happened, and all the people involved in this experiment are now writing books about it. And the English book people can read on this is called Mass Contacts by yeah. Stefano Breja. He's an engineer, and he saw these people. And they were not from here. They had an underwater base uh, off the base. Of, and, and the fishermen were so scared to go out because these big tunnels of water would come out from the, from the, from the Pescara uh, Adriatic Coast. This is on the Adriatic Coast. And this is a real case. It's called the Friendship or Amicizia case. And, uh, and it blew me away because I realized that, that on this planet there are bases of these people. I'm going to call them people instead of aliens. Yes. And they are trying to do some kind of communication with us. And uh, I agree, too. And, you know, the, the signs are all around us. Uh, is there a particular person or figurehead that you have yet to interview and you would love to, to bring it to uh, the next level with that person? Well, I interview a lot of people, from David Icke to Richard Hoagland to everybody. <laughs> it's like, uh, I, you know, just I'd love to sit down and have a talk with two people, and they're not u ufologists or whistleblowers. They're Steven Spielberg and Ray Bradbury. Uh, Ray Bradbury, because I read all his Mars books, and I think he knows more than he says he knows. And yes. Steven Spielberg, because I'd love to pick his brain. I'd like to know why he did Close Encounters, because it completely changed my life. Absolutely. Me too. I think for a lot of people, you know, uh, not from uh, a commercial standpoint, because unfortunately some people have taken it to that level, but just on a basic core, uh, from the music all the way to that first scene when the, the, the ramp opens up and that uh, gangly sort of spider-looking alien walks down, and then the graze after that, you know, and uh, the rest is history from that point. Well, actually, when Francois Truffaut does the hand signal and the alien answers him, I, I started to cry, and that's what changed my whole 
Yeah, because we had to use hand signals. I mean, we, what do you do? You can't go up and shake hands. You can't talk because they do telepathic. They don't learn your language. Uh, you know, it, it it was a moment that just showed me what contact could be like. And and I and, and I have this clip I always show when I do presentations where uh, this young girl at the actor studio says to Steven Spielberg, "Do you believe in aliens?" And he turns around and he says, "Yes, I do believe in aliens." <laughs> I love it. You know, it, it you know, at least I've uh, never admitted it. You know, and uh, there's another interesting thing that uh, happens uh, on that ramp scene as well. Uh, that uh, entire uh, crew of, of Air Force men uh, come down. And I, I read somewhere that there was an actual program like that for real. Uh, I don't know what Are you I talking about it. the Serpo? The Serpo exchange? Well, the Serpo, well, you're talking about Serpo. Y- you mean... I think what you're talking about is how they prepared those astronauts to go aboard and do an exchange. And then they were all dressed in orange, and they, and, and they were, you know, the priest was reading their, uh, you know, prayers, and they were supposed to go aboard, and they did an exchange. The triple material, which is out there, is extremely interesting. And if people listen to Collins and Doty and Exempt from Disclosure, that's another book that's out there. Part of that exchange program was real, part of it, just, you know, they they won't go into details exactly what happened, but there was some kind of attempt at an exchange program. Now, p- people say, how can that ha- be? Because we're dealing with 60 years, 60 years since Roswell. So a whole bunch of stuff has happened that people don't know about in 60 years. And, you know, there's there's a lot of information out there. If people would just do some reading and studying of little bits, and you said it before, you said there's misinformation or disinformation mixed in with the real stuff. And so you have to know or feel what the real stuff is. And one of those issues is uh, the the bombing of the moon. And uh, as an exopolitician and studier studier of exopolitics, what was your feeling of that? I, that didn't sit right with me. Well, actually, I didn't approve. I did not. <laughs> I don't know how to say this diplomatically. I did not agree with that article in the least. Uh, I, I, the word bombing was was very powerful and, and unnecessary. There was a probe put on the moon, so there was no bombing of it. And and, and you know we go off the deep end sometimes and interpret things. However, a, 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 a Colonel Corso told me that there was you know, some intent to, to bring nuclear on the moon. And I think that's one of the reasons why we were invited to not go back there. You, we, you know, you, you could explode. How many atomic bombs did we explode? I know I, in my, one of my books I interviewed a French geophysicist, and France and Polynesia on the, uh, Polynesia on the Bikini Atoll did 800 tests. Americans did much more than that, and India did a whole bunch. So here we are, thousands and hundreds of bombing tests. I mean, I think we could get it right after two or three. And somebody is watching us do this, and and they're thinking, don't bring it to our planet, or don't bring it out into outer space, or don't bring it to the moon. And it's just such an illogical way of dealing with, with life to have all these, you know, bomb tests. And, and let me ask you on another uh, type of topic. Uh, with the recent uh, discovery of, of liquid on one of uh, Saturn's moons, uh, do you feel that that might be a possible uh, adventure point for humanity in, in the next No, year? I don't know, Jason. I really don't. I think uh, what I will say is I'm a very close friend of Richard Hoagland's. I absolutely admire his work. I really do think he has a real case for the fact that we've been on Mars and then came to the to Earth and that, that we have, like, mirror images in Egypt of what's on the planet Mars. And, and uh, you know, the movie Mission to Mars didn't make it more than three weeks in the theaters, but that has a lot in there. And I think that we should be looking at our closest planet. I, I, I believe that probably he's right in a lot of the things he says. As far as there being life up there... I interviewed uh, a man from the European Space uh, Agency, uh, uh, Dr. Formisano, who, with a spectrometer, found that there was formaldehyde and ammonia coming out of Mars every 72 hours. So something is up there that's creating ammonia and formaldehyde, which is a byproduct that is dissipated every 72 hours, and that's human byproduct. 
So, you know, I'm I'm thinking, okay, you know, everybody has a little piece of these this this puzzle, you know, the European Space Agency is willing to talk about it, but NASA was not. Uh I covered that conference. Uh so, you know, maybe they're just waiting for the perfect time. I mean, I don't know. They're waiting for timing of some kind. I know the Vatican got in, you know, you didn't ask me about that, but I lived near the Vatican when I was in Rome for 15 years because that's, you know, where I did most of my work. And um, that they've just come forth saying that, you know, aliens are our brothers and sisters and that, that it is not against religion to believe in them. Now, why are they doing that? So we've got a whole bunch of disclosure that's already happening Absolutely, and then recently you had Stephen Hawkins as well, you know, and uh, a few other people uh, opening up to the fact that it's a possibility. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, I too am a a huge fan of Richard Hoagland's work, and he would uh, really be somebody that I would love to speak to. But uh, I've always had a fascination with Mars, and uh, I do think of it as a home away from home for humanity. And uh, I don't know, to me, the, the whole idea of us closing all these opportunities and, and these ideas to life visiting or life existing elsewhere, it just doesn't make sense. And uh, it's something... Can I ask you why you're interested in this? Because I'm curious. Because <laughs> you have our show on it. So how come you're interested? Uh, it, to me, I, I don't see it. Life in one solitary planet. Uh, it just It's not logical, as you mentioned earlier. The logic factor doesn't click, you know, uh, there's so many different types of people. There's so many different types of animals. There has to be so many different types of life uh, outside of what we see in front of us. And uh, even within our own bodies, there's millions of types of cells that make up one entity. You know, so imagine the vastness of the universe. It's just beyond one person, one planet, one solar system, one Milky Way. You know, it, it's just endless. It just blows your mind. So that's why I'm interested, because I, I like to see things beyond the simple spectrum, you know, and <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense at all. No, it does, because you're curious. Yeah, and you're, and you're intellectually curious and you're spiritually curious, uh, and, and if you find out, you know, what you want to find out, it, it changes your life. I mean, it makes you more than just human. It makes well, you uh, a member of a cosmic family. That's right, and I posted a, a commercial that I found quite interesting uh, in my Facebook group, and... Uh, it's for eyewear, but the interesting fact is these people have these, these glasses on, and it kind of dims their view, and they're kind of lostly looking up at the sky, which is good if you want to look up at the sky, but, but everything that's happening around them, they're oblivious to, and, you know, that's what I feel uh, most of people face every day. They go to work, they come home, they watch TV, kind of do whatever they're doing, you know, simplistically get the day done. But they miss the big picture all around them, you know, unfortunately. So I I thought that was quite interesting, and that's why I posted that. Well, I think it's easier for them to live that way. I mean, I I really can't blame people who are not interested in this subject matter because they don't want to complicate their lives. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. (laughs) It's your life. It'll burn your brain, yeah, because there's so much possibility and so much material that you just don't know where to start and where to end, you know. So you're absolutely right on that. Well, it, it's hard for me because I'm doing such realistic, hard work to, to archive all the witness testimony. I can't even tell you how many people I've interviewed. I, you know, one of my interviews is even a man that was present at the Holloman Landing, you know, that where President Eisenhower was uh, met with, with beings at, at Holloman. I mean, he was there. I mean, I, I get these witness testimonies for people uh, who were firsthand sources, and, and I'm putting it all together, but I figured this, that it probably will not come out in this lifetime uh, it, where we all are. It probably will be in some area of the library about 100 years from now when kids know this is real and they have to do a research paper on it and they have to go back and get the original sources of the people that were involved. And so... What I do is educational. I mean, my books are like textbooks. I mean, they've got word-for-word interviews. So that those those kids, 100 years from now, will go and get the testimonies of these people, and they'll be able to write a research paper. It's, it's That's how serious this is. I mean, because we can't handle it. Well, look what we're, look what we're, if you look at the news, look at what's going on. 
it, we, there's no room to talk about this, you know, with the, with the tragedies and the and the seriousness and people losing their jobs and the economy and a whole bunch of other stuff. That's right, and, and you know that's an important issue too because uh, realistically life goes on, you know, and uh, sometimes it's it's tough to focus on the universe when your own you know micro or macro world of whatever you want to look at it it, is falling apart in front of you so you're absolutely right yeah and i feel sorry you know for people who who want to talk to their friends and their friends don't want to even have anything to do with it you should just not force it on anybody you know but i do believe that we should have courses in exopolitics i've been teaching now for three years and my students are from africa from china from canada from the United States, but from England. I have students from all over the world that are interested. And and I think that I, I dream that it would be in some university uh, and, someday because this is, needs to be taken seriously. Did, do you feel that this was always your destiny, you know, uh, right from the start? You just had to find it and now that you have, you know, it's, it's a blessing <coughs> in guys, let's say. Well, you know, I don't know why I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> if you really want to know, it certainly doesn't is not for fame, fortune, or money. Because uh, more of my money has gone out. All my teaching, all my teaching salary in Rome went out to the conferences that I brought the big top names to. But I, you know, I think that it's probably a contribution to the planet. Uh, it's like you know, I'm just leaving something behind for the future generations. And, and it's still, you know, that's what Colonel Carson felt too. A lot of the people that are working in this area that are whistleblowers, also they're leaving something behind. They, they're leaving the truth. If you're searching for the truth, they're going to leave you the truth just before they go. And, and it's my job to, to, to get the story or to get the interview and write it. Uh, you know, I don't put my opinion. It's word for word what the tape says. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, what does uh, Paula Harris do away from all of this? Well, I do a lot of traveling. Uh, you know, I, can I tell you? I just went to the C, the East SETI conference. I just spoke there in Trout Lake, Washington, with yeah. those guys, and and they have so much fun because they've got equipment, night screening devices at night to be able to see the sky in a whole different way. Wow. So I love just traveling and go. It, that was an incredible experience for people that want to ever go to James Gilliland's ranch. <laughs> like the fun. It's like totally fun. So what do I do? I, I you know, I live in beautiful Colorado, so I spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, I, um, you know, I, I try my best to, to integrate work with, with um, you know, having fun. You know, I, I'm a movie goer. I love movies. I, you know, in between work, I can communicate with people from all over the world. I mean, if you watch me, I know you you look at my Facebook page. I mean, half of it's in Italian because most of my friends are there. I, I worked out of Italy for 15 years. I'm kind of an expatriate. I just came back in 2007. So I've just been in Boulder for the last, like, three years. So, yeah, I just try to go back and forth, travel a lot. And, and, and you know, this work is, is interesting. Uh, and, and let me ask you this. Uh, if there was a, a full-scale uh, showing, let's say, of multiple uh, UFOs or, or visitors. Uh, what would you do after that? Would you have a hard time stepping away from this line of work? No, you know what I would hope. You know, if I, I'm, I'm the daughter of a diplomat. My dad was the Italian Council of the State of Rhode Island. I'd like to be on a commission committee or United Nations or something where. You know, we would work out some kind of, of, of galactic diplomacy. In other words, yes. uh, how you meet these people and how you communicate with these people and what do they have to offer us and what do we have to offer them. I'd like to be involved in the actual diplomatic uh, relations with these people. And I say diplomatic because they are not like us. There is no part of their reality that is like earthly reality. They're totally alien reality. And... I, I'm curious. I would love to be try to br- bridge that gap and see what we might have in common, what we don't have in common. I mean, that would be darn exciting, don't you think? It would. It would uh, definitely be an eye opener, <laughs> to say the least. You know. Yeah, and, uh, I, you, you you know, and you try to make con- you try to figure it out. You, it, it right. would be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely would. I don't think anything else would ever come close. 
That's for sure. Yeah, I'm hoping. No, everybody's hoping, but we're all hoping. I think even Stephen Hawking uh, kind of hoping that it'll happen in our lifetime. Yes. Uh, and do you think it will? Uh, what's your? Uh, can you give uh, an odds, uh, you know, like a Vegas odds type thing? Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is this, I really believe, and a lot of the, the literature I've read and a lot of the people that I've spoken to, that if we get close to destroying ourselves, we will have intervention. We all have, you know, like they have intervention for drugs and everything. Yes. Uh, you know, they have interventions for, yeah, for, for alcoholism and all that. They have a family intervention. They all come in and they bring you to their rehab. I think, I think the aliens will come and interve- do major intervention on this planet and bring us all to rehab. Well, let me ask you uh, from the inner circle, what, what's their take on 2012? Is, is that uh, just a, a misread date and time, or, or is there something to it? No, well, it's, it's based on the Mayan calendar, and, and the Mayans were very bright. In fact, maybe the Mayans were even, you know, alien-based. Who knows? But uh, it's based on the Mayan calendar. The thing is this, though, that in, in order for any civiliz- civilization to evolve, for, for you to change anything, you have to have something happening. Otherwise, why would you bother? So probably this is the 11, the 2011, 2012 is a period of change, but a good change. It's like birthing a baby. You know, you go through the pains and you have a baby. Uh, so maybe it's like a good change of birthing a new age. That's what Colonel Corso seemed to think. And I, I think that maybe we're going through those pains with those, uh, you know, birth pains of uh, we have to if we don't evolve we're in for major trouble so we'll probably evolve now is it the end of the world no is it the end of an era probably are we going to have a whole different vision after that probably and it depends on where everybody's at how they live it how they they go through it that's a great point and i always feel too that uh, there might be an interesting side note to this uh, because if the entire world or at least a, a large number of the population all concentrate on that one particular day uh, with the mass consciousness ability of hum- humans, maybe that might awaken true telepathy and, uh, you know, psychic powers uh, all because of that concentration. Yeah, I mean, that works with Jose Aguilas in 1986 and the co- harmonic convergence when he had everybody meditating at the same time for peace yeah. or something. Here in Boulder, Colorado, they men- measured the Earth's frequency, and it changed. Mm-hmm. I mean, if people get together, but they all have to want to do it, and they can't do it because we have a meteor hit the planet, and we yeah. have tsunamis, and we have all this horrible stuff. People can't come together over tragedy. They've got to come together over being enlightened, being wanting change, wanting to be enlightened, not because there's a whole bunch of death, a whole bunch of earthquakes. So I think we get to choose how we do it. I think we get to choose how we evolve, and I'm on the camp. I don't know where you are. I'm on the camp for doing it positive, for positive change. I, I absolutely, because I, I have two young children, and uh, I, I want to see them succeed in life and and get to the next point, and and you know continue on uh, the human travel. And uh, if if it all ends as some doomsayers believe, uh, that goes out the window, you know, and I don't see that happening. So I tend to to stay on the positive side, as you do. Yeah, no, we can do it. We can do it without all the tragedy. I mean, we can handle it. I think we can do the the changing, the shifting, and um, I think that all earthly cultures, or even the Hopi Indians, are talking about going into the fifth world. I mean, it's a change, but it's not you know a horrible change. No. Uh, and and I think that that it's necessary at this point in, in our in our evolution. I mean. We cannot stay the way we are. We we are talk about good guys and bad guys. I mean, we we have a society that has a lot of negativity in it. And if yep. the aliens are watching us, they're saying, "What are these people doing?" No, and and you're right. And there is change happening. And, and you know, like if you look, for example, the, this is going to simplify it. You know, in, in some ways, but uh, basketball players of the '60s, especially the taller people, they did not look. Well, you know, but if you look at tall people now, they absolutely function just the same as a person of average height. You know, and that's an evolutionary change. Uh, small, but yet important. You know, and as you said, change will happen. Uh, and I think positive change is, is the best thing. And what exactly is going to take place, I don't know. 
but I, I just feel that it's going to be for the better of humanity. Yeah, well, maybe people come together. I mean, you were talking about you being dis- distraught over the infighting and so forth, and I think the infighting is what keeps the secret secret. I mean, if people will get together around a table and start sharing all their information and everybody try to make sense of this puzzle instead of debunk each other and you know go after each other's research, if everybody would just sit around and talk about it and, and say, I found out this, what did you find out? Uh, what do you think, you know, and it's like a think tank type situation. We get closer to the real truth. Yes, we would. Uh, well, let me uh, add on to that. What would you say would be the opinion, uh, you know, because there are conspiracy theorists out there who uh, uh, subscribe to the fact that there's Illuminati groups that, you know, have dark secrets and uh, control the humanity and progress and growth. Would they be involved in in this infighting, you know, kind of stoking the fire type deal? Uh, or is that just something that's, you know, Hollywood and uh, fairy tale type thing? No, no, since the beginning of time, if you study history, ancient history, there have yeah. been control groups since the beginning of time, whether it be the church that dominated all of Europe or, you know, other control groups. There's control groups. Uh, but if we, but, and they got their agenda, and they're playing their game. And there's other people that are interested in this, and they're in the back room, and they're playing their game. They want to know, but they're not going to tell the ordinary people. The, the common people, they say, don't need to know. So they're not going to, we don't have a need to know, and we're never going to know because they've got it handled. So are there groups that are powerful groups? Absolutely. Do they have all the information? No, they don't have all of it. They have some of it, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to handle it. It's not easy. I mean, this is a big, big story. This is a big, big situation. Um, I, they, everybody that's intelligent is talking about it in the back room. It's just that it's not on your 6 o'clock news. And as far as conspiracy theory, I, I personally have a statement on my website that takes me away from conspiracy theory because I don't want to get into it. Uh, you know, it, it, for me it's a waste of time because... You talk about something like 9-11, it already happened. It, it, if people would just do something about it, I would, I would talk about it, but they just like to hear about it. They like to hear about it, they like all the gory details, but they don't go and do anything about it. So I don't, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do conspiracy theory things because not enough is done. There's an awareness. There's enough people out there, David Icke. There's all kinds of people talking about it, so they don't need me to add to it. I want to stay with the ET presence being part of exopolitics and what to do about contact. That's a great point. You know, and each person has their own specialty. And uh, as you said, there are those who are focusing on on that area. And there's yourself who is doing such great work. And, you know, uh, you bring information to the public that is almost unreachable in, in some cases. And for that, uh, I will you some gratitude. You know, I want to say thank you for that, and I'm sure everyone who's read your books and seen your material feels the same way. Uh, but did, what's your project uh, that you're working on now? Do you have any uh, things that you'd like to tell the people? Oh, a big story. <laughs> I, I, a big, big story. I mean, it's one of the biggest stories I've ever worked on in my life, and it's got uh, so much material with it. So, much, But it, it will not come out until... Let's put it this way. This story will be revealed. This is one of the biggest stories I've ever worked on. It has to do with the UFO crash. And, and, and it will probably, I'll talk about it at the International UFO Congress in Phoenix, Arizona, that's sponsored by Open Minds. I, I will, that'll be February uh, 24th in Phoenix. And, and I hope to have all the stuff ready, including the, the material, the witnesses, and everything there. And it's, it is a real big story. It's, uh, but it's at to, uh, uh, just another piece to the puzzle. That's all it is. It's another piece to the puzzle uh, so that people can make their own decisions as to what's happening. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, uh, it takes me a year to do a story because I have to research it. I have to get all the people. I have to go, especially if it's a story that was 40 years ago. Um, so that's one of the things. Plus, I'm speaking at the UFO Watchtower in, in um uh, in Colorado, it's it's in the San Luis Valley, and they have it every year. And 
who will be there with that will be Stan Romanak, and his case is really interesting. Plus the Charles Hall case. Have you ever interviewed Charles Hall? Uh, not as of yet. Uh, he would be uh, another very valuable guest to have. Him. Yeah, he would because he it was a meteorologist on on the Indian Springs facility of the Area 51 base where. He, he met with tall white aliens and their children in 1965. I did that story, yeah. and I brought him to, I flew him there in that area, and he retold his story on video. That that case is amazing, and he was, you know, in the Air Force as a meteorologist when this happened in 1965. So if, if you, and he will be at this conference also, and the name of his books are Millennium Hospitality, and he has four of them. And, and these, and the man's telling the truth. I mean, we've got information coming out of military people that you know have gone through this, and yeah. um, you know, I'm hoping everybody just read. I have a list of, of 30 books in my in my um, uh, two of my books, so that people can just read these these uh, these accounts of these people. And that's a great point too, because it all connects. If there's a chain link. You know, and one thing leads to another, and by you saying that, it, it, it's extremely important because uh, to rely on only one source is not enough. Like the, the information is so immense, and there's so much out there. You know, and, and it's really a good thing that you do that. Well, I'm hoping to make it easy for for everyone because all I do is just bring the the people's words to to you know make it easier for people, and and you do a good job too. And thanks for everything you do. For all those people that are interested in this subject matter. Thank you so much. You know, and uh, it, it's well worth it. At the end of the day, as you said, it's not for fame, it's not for fortune, it's to share information and to also learn something uh, every day, you know, and, and something interesting, something new. Uh, it may be the same material or a similar story of it, but uh, it never gets old. Uh, and it keeps no, and you have, like, one thing that's really good about your show, and that is that you connect the paranormal. To it, and, and the paranormal is not paranormal. It's it's our culture that calls it that. Because if you go to the Aboriginal cultures all over the world, including, you know, uh, whether you go to New Zealand or India or so forth, the Eastern cultures see the paranormal as perfectly normal. It's dimensional. It, it, there are weird things that may happen. There are interdimensional phenomenon, and they're all connected to the UFO phenomenon. That's right. I always felt that way too. You know, and. Uh... You read stories of uh, people seeing UFOs when they see Bigfoot and uh, vice versa, you know, and uh, there are those out there that don't want to connect the two, but uh, it all seems to relate to each other, you know. And that's no, that, the whole Bigfoot case, they have to read, see their books out on this and their photos and there's a video out on this. The, the Bigfoot case is just a, an example of an interdimensional being that people see every now and then that's connected also with the UFO phenomenon, but, but you have to study it. It can't be just that, you know, one person says something. Uh, and, you know, uh, Jack Lapsovitis is re- writing a book, and he's not only seen them, he's photographed them, and and, uh, and his book is going to be on Bigfoot. And there's so many, and I've interviewed him, actually. He's in, in, in uh, all of the, How Do You Speak to a Ball of Light. I've interviewed him about the Bigfoot phenomenon it's all connected uh, it's you have to look at the fact that we live in a multi-dimensional world and there's weirdness going on in those dimensions absolutely and uh as far as uh, any new books are, are you working on any of those uh, for the near yeah, future well i have another one coming but you know the reason why i'm doing it is because i got all these new interviews including the one i have holloman that i just mentioned plus the milton yes. torres one Plus, I have so many new interviews. I've, I've got to put them together so that the future has them. Uh, I can't just leave them in a drawer. And, and the new book uh, will be about, you know, a, a por- it's called Exopolitics, a Porthole to Another Reality. And, and I'm interested in dimensional portholes and portholes and wormholes and all that kind of stuff because we've had a lot of weirdness coming out of the skies lately, and you've probably seen it all the oh, videos yeah, of the worlds and all that. Well, this is not normal, and this no. is not harp. I don't believe it's harp. <laughs> and, it, it's, it's definitely not a missile either. <laughs> no, it's not a missile. It's not harp. What's happening, I think, is that the veil between dimensions is getting thinner, and we're seeing stuff that was always there, but we're seeing it now clearer, you know, in a clearer way. 
And, and when the veil starts dropping between these dimensions, and we live in a dimensional world, uh, we're going to see other realities. It is so weird. that you know. So basically, that's why I called it Portal to Another Reality. And I, I just want to give kind of a vision of the future. It'll be my last exopolitics book which means that I have written three exopolitics books. <laughs> and uh, Alfred Weber wrote the first one. Michael is, uh, Sala has written two, and I've written, uh, you know, three of them. And so for the people who want to study exopolitics, there, there's, you know, books out there on exopolitics. Well, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit uh, more about those spirals, because uh, I, I kind of came up with just a theory of why this might be happening as well. And I just want to run it by you and see what you might think. Uh, with the CERN uh, experiment that took place, uh, you know, to try to open up a mini black hole or wormhole and uh, various other things like that, could it be possible that uh, we actually phase shift it into a closer dimension? Because you mentioned dimensional, interdimensional uh, reality, closer to these beings and crafts and, and animals and creatures. Uh, by the, using this machine, and that's why we're able to see all of these spirals and uh, strange lights in the sky and, uh, you know, massive motherships and, and whatnot. Well, I don't think it's CERN that caused it, but I do think we've done it. we're doing that. I think it's happening. Yeah. I think we're we're going into another, we're shifting into another dimension. The CERN collider, the super collider, that thing was, was aimed at outer space. That, that, that is powerful technology. That is... I'm wondering. I don't even want to go there about about yeah. how powerful and dangerous that is. And I wonder what the benefits. Is that going to help humanity? Is that going to feed every kid on the planet? Is that going to uh, is that going to stop poverty and help everybody and save the? Uh, yeah, I wonder. You know, if aliens are looking at us, I'm thinking, what are they? They're looking at us, saying, what are those people thinking? Yeah. Uh, we're creating it to open up a dimensional portal in outer space. For what you reason? Know. You know, yeah. and so I don't think it's CERN that, Jason, that, 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 that does it. But I think that that planet just automatically, vibrationally is shifting, is shifting. So what, what's happening is we're, we're seeing all this weirdness that everybody's attributing to HARP. I don't think HARP is doing the weirdness all over the world. Uh, you know, it's uh, some of it. Is is just a shift in dimensions and portals opening. I mean, uh, if you study this Dan Romanek case, when he when the when he has you know visitations, there's a big light that flashes. It goes flash, and something comes out of it. Yeah. So it's like a a, a, a a an opening of portals. That's very interesting too, and uh, you know that's. Uh what uh, Stargate was based on, and uh, a lot of Hollywood, uh, you know, Star Trek. Uh, and you can see, as you mentioned earlier in the show, uh, that Hollywood has inside information, <laughs> a lot of it, too. Uh, well, I believe there's Stargates. I, I believe there are Stargates, I mean, uh, that yeah, you could walk in, in between them. I, I think somebody knows where they are. Uh, I, I, you know, we, <laughs> we don't. But, you know, there are some very special places on the planet. And yes. it would be interesting to get a group of people together to have that conversation who, who <laughs> believe in Stargates and where they might be and ley lines, you know, electromagnetic ley lines. I, I was in a situation in, in the Lincolnshire in England that were, was on two ley lines, and that house had so much weirdness I can't even explain, uh, you know, from voices to to people walking by that were really not there, that to, uh, you know, shifting uh, lights to orbs coming in and out of the wall to, uh, it depends on what, and th this was on two electromagnetic ley lines. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, it, there are situations uh, on Earth that are very paranormal. Uh, they should be studied. They should be, if our science can't explain it, then we should alter the science. So that we can't explain it, we we need to invent a new science. Absolutely, and it, it, I think that's the fear factor, though, uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's the, the, the fear of change, something new, something unknown, strange. That's why it, it can't happen uh, as fast as we would like it, you know. And uh, also a, a fear of letting the old ways go, 
in some people, you know, and uh, the world won't change that much. Uh, that's the advice I can give to them, you know, just let it happen. It, it's bound to happen. I, I don't think anyone can stop it from happening. No, and I think, you, if, if, but you can do it gradually. I mean, it doesn't have to be like an overnight shift. I mean, you yeah, can exactly. do it. You do it gradually, and I think your program of uh, people reading, uh, you know, there's so many videos out there, Hollywood, all of that is kind of easing you, easing people into a new vision of, of what things could be. And I think it's exciting. I mean, I, I don't think there's anything to be afraid of. If you stay in the same place all the time mentally, there's no growing. You don't grow. You just become the same old stodgy person. So I think that, you know, that, that this is all exciting. And certainly for your daughters or your kids or your, the future generation. Well, it's a, a fascinating aspect because uh, already my, uh, my daughter, she just she turned five, and she's aware of her surroundings. You know, she looks up and she's like, Daddy, is that a UFO, you know, or what's that strange light? Uh, you know, uh, I've seen a monster, and I'm, it just it makes my heart smile, you know, because I'm like, yes, <laughs> she's aware, and she sees the bigger picture, and uh, I hope it continues, because as you know, kids, uh, they lose interest in things very quickly, so this might be the, the the interesting thing for her for the next little while, and then as she hits teenagehood and adulthood, it just fades away, but I, I hope not, you know. Well, I think kids, kids go in the direction that their parents are in, in other words, they learn from example. They learn if the parents aren't afraid, they're not going to be afraid. Uh, so I think that one of our responsibilities is that fear is the thing that shuts down knowledge, that shuts down progress, that shuts down evolution. So we don't want to get into the fear factor. And, you know, the masses, or we call them masses, all the people are controlled by fear. This is one of the David Icke things. I mean, David's a good friend. I, I like him so much. Uh, he's a little exaggerated, but... He, he believes that fear is what he says. You know, we were we were evolving. In my interview, he did a great interview for me in my first book, Connecting the Dots, Making Sense of the UFO Phenomenon. He said, you know, humanity was evolving to the point where they could meet the aliens halfway. But then 9/11 happened, and, and, and terrorism went, and we all got into the fear mode, and oh, we we stopped growing. You know, we we stopped moving because fear is what stops everybody from growing and. He was absolutely right. You know, we could have met them halfway. Oh, yes. Well, if you look at uh, since 9-11, uh, the last decade and a bit have been a complete blur, if you think about it, you know, because of so much control, of so much fear-mongering from all angles. that It's like constant cloudy skies. You know, and now we're starting to see a little bit beyond that. Uh, I know the economic situation is still not where it needs to be, but money's not everything. You know, if you have a healthy family, a healthy home, you can make do with what you have, you know, and that, that's what I try to live my life by. I, I hope other people can see that too, you know, and don't be afraid anymore. Uh, the worst is over, I believe. Well, you know, <laughs> I always try, you know, when I teach the course on, on Hollywood and disclosure, I say, did you happen to see uh, the Star Trek theory? You know that Gene Rottenberry got a lot of his information from E.T. involvement. Do you know that there was no money in the Star Trek situation? There was not a money economy. It was done through barter and other kinds of things. Uh, and that, that they basically had a very just and diverse kind of vision. I mean, Klingons and all the other kind of people out there. It, it, it was It was a very futuristic vision and I and and I talk about Ron Berry in my course he really believed in human potential he thought a man was amazing and man could adapt to anything and man had incredible potential our species which is man you know and it's really interesting because I did an interview with Edgar Mitchell Apollo 14 astronaut and he says you know he says when you ask where you're from you're going to say New York or Colorado or whatever he said, till, till we say we are from planet Earth, the aliens won't know what to do with us because we're all separated by our individual localities. You say, I am a human species from planet Earth. Then we have a connectedness or we have a oneness that can have contact 
with the cosmos. But when you say, yeah, I'm from, you know, I'm from Baghdad or I'm from wherever. But we have one commonality. We're all human. We're all human species. You're and, and, right. And I Edgar said, we've got to get that together. That's right. I, I think the last time that something like that happened uh, was when, uh, you know, uh, Apollo reached the moon and the Neil Armstrong and the rest of the fellows touched down. Uh, for the first time ever, it wasn't America reached the moon. You know, people around the world, world were saying, we did it, you know, as a planet. And right, it was mankind, one small yes. step for mankind. Yeah, the one small you know, step for man and one, so, uh, you know, big step for mankind. Uh, yeah, no, I know, we did it. We did it one time. <laughs> we did it one time. It's like, yeah, get a clue. And this, it happens again. We're just stuck on this planet. I would love to be part of the, you know, the crew that gets the first opportunity to step back. And I say back because, uh, you know, uh, obviously I think humanity has been to Mars before. Uh, back on Mars, that would be an absolute amazing achievement. You know, it's not another country or another continent, but another planetary body <laughs> outside of our domain here. It would just be extremely fascinating to me. Well, Obama wants to do that. Everybody's criticizing him, but he wanted to stop the moon program, and everybody goes, oh, he's taking money away from NASA. No, he said, forget the moon. We're going to Mars. Yes. Yeah, we've been there. Been there, done that for the moon. <laughs> We're going to Mars. And people didn't, you know, people, I, it's like, I, I'm wondering what they're thinking. It's, uh, mm-hmm. it, 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 it'd be exciting to, to go on to Mars. Why do we need to go back to the moon? It's, but, but you know, everybody has a vested interest in their jobs and their money. It's all about money uh, and, and in, their, in keeping their, their territory. But, you know, I, I think man needs to get a bigger vision, much bigger vision. Mm-hmm. And, and if we have this vision, we'll all go in there together. I mean, we'll all get there together. Well, there's, uh, you know, groups out there that are, are trying to achieve that. And uh, it seems like the progress is stagnant. You know, they get up to a certain point. And then something knocks them ten notches back, you know, and uh, it's just unfortunate because it's, I guess it would be the same as, uh, you know, uh, building the pyramid all over again from scratch, uh, the Great Pyramid. It's just such a, a monumental task. And as you said earlier, we all have to be on the same page. You know? We all have to want to have it happen. I think that... It's going to happen whether we want to have it happen or not. Yeah. That's where your 212 thing or, you know, 2012 thing comes in or your uh, your evolutionary thing comes in is it's going to happen. Now, how that happens is entirely up to mankind. Uh, you know, how that works is entirely up to mankind. Yeah. And, you know, I think that Gene Rottenberry had an amazing vision. Uh, you know, I, I admire, apart from Star Trek, there isn't any... And, and, and the fans of Star Trek can see that vision. Yep. The Trekkies and the people that can see that we are part of a, a federation. A lot of my work, even lately, uh, in, in my last books, when I do a lot of the work on, with contactees, especially one case in, in near northern Italy, uh, the contactee saw a federation. He saw all different types of aliens on a ship. It, that there is really a federation of people uh, even in the Billy Meyer story, it wasn't just uh, the Pleiadians. There were other people, uh, other federations that were aligned with each other, that there's already an alignment of, of peoples, of aliens that, that belong to a federation. And, and um, you know, they're, they, they've gotten used to each other. They're all different, and they, they can all come together. And that's what I, I was hoping, and I'm hoping... The planet can do, especially uh, Edgar Mitchell says it's not going to happen until you know we all get together. We can't have contact because, like, who are the aliens going to go to? Are they going to go to China because they've got the most people on the planet? So they said we'll negotiate with China, leave everybody else. Are they going to come to the United States, which I think they already did? Uh, are they going to go to Germany, as I think they already did? Uh, and where are they going to go? It, it, they should get together with a representation of the entire planet. That's uh, a very good point. And uh, maybe they went to, to Ottawa, Canada. 
I, I oh, well, there was a landing spot. Paul Howell, you're talking about being involved in some <laughs> kind of a platform. You know, they 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 did they took it seriously back then. I mean, yes. as if the, as, as if we needed a platform. <laughs> yes. I really do believe, though, now that that we I think about it, that that Close Encounters was probably true. You know, and that's the warm. We didn't make that up. That was. Too. Yeah, it's too good to be to be totally you know manufactured from a, a fictional script because uh, everything that seems to come at you in that movie, you know, little tidbits here, little tidbits there, even the the little probe devices uh, that come down, you know, a lot of people see those uh, not exactly as represented in the movie, but um, very similar, you know, and. Uh, the, the channeling aspect of that mountain. Uh, it's right, the channeling. Good. Yeah, everybody got the same message, and, and, okay. and they got it through their minds. Yeah, okay. absolutely. You know, and that's the fascinating aspect about it. You know, yeah, and, and the tones, the tones, the fact that, that you can have a commonality with tones or sound. The okay. sound could be... I mean, it brings me to thinking, I mean, without being too negative, I, I mean, I don't know what we're doing waiting for radio telescope messages. I think we probably got them a long time ago. Uh, I think we got them. Uh, SETI probably got something. Uh, and and we've been getting messages not only from, I think, from, you know, space for years. I think we've, yeah, you mentioned the crop circles. We've been getting sightings, messages. We've been getting contact for a long time. Well, a friend of mine made a great point one time. Uh, it, he said this, that, uh, you know, okay, sure, we can hear that screeching, but uh, we can't hear the sonar that they also sent. You know, uh, that's probably exactly like these aliens. They can hear us screeching, but they can't hear the, the messages we're sending them, you know, because like, they're just not even aware of it, and they don't even care. Well, I think the radio telescopes, especially the ones that, that Paul Allen just helped study put in California, are to pick up pick up messages from space. Right. But but you know, you're looking at this, right? And then we get the space shuttle missions. If you've ever gone on YouTube, and all the all the UFOs that are following them, right. and 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 STS-75 with all those orbs around the 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 satellite there, and 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 and. The NASA transmissions, if you've ever gotten those, uh, you know, looking at, at what's happened with space shuttle flights, with UFOs right. actually following them, and then and then you say, well, why in the world are we sending, waiting for a message from space? <laughs> it's like, well, it's uh, like Hello? Hello, I'm here. Hello. Yes, sorry, it just got a really weird kind of zap sound, so I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, 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 no I'm, I'm still here, and, and uh, it, it, you have, like, 20 more minutes of your, yes, of your uh, show, right? Let, let, me, let me ask you uh, for the, the, the fact that uh, some people have really come down hard on this individual, uh, Jose Escamilla, and uh, his, uh, his rod research. Is that an area that you follow? Or you've looked into well, I know Jose. He's totally amazing. I don't know why people do stuff like that. I you know, know he's either. very, very, very good researcher, and and he's photographed something we don't know what they are. Right. And 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 but but it's there, and he didn't put it there, and and he's able to photograph it now. In order to support his theory, um, I saw some films. Well, I saw some films while I was in Italy of an air show in, in Aviano, again, the NATO base, and I saw all kinds of these rod-type things going right into the ground from the sky in people's home movies. I saw this in home movies, and if you ask me what they are, I have no idea. But the fact that Jose would put that together and he would add that to research he does not invite criticism. You should thank him very much for adding to research. I mean, his movie, The Greatest Story uh, Never Told, is absolutely amazing. And uh, he's, he's, his heart and soul, just like Stephen Bassett's and a lot of other people, are into getting this information out of there. Uh, out there, you know, it's not, it's no other motivation. So, oh, yeah, well. rods exist. We don't know what they are. I have no idea. Have you ever seen the South American pictures of rods uh, on Facebook, you see Arturo Robles uh, in the weirdest looking things yeah. that look like worms in the sky. You want to explain that to me? I, 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 it's not a balloon. 
No, I have no idea. Not. These these white worms that are all over the Mexican skies. Uh, they again, you know, I think that the veil is dropping, and there's weirdness behind it, and that dimension has a bunch of weirdness that we don't know what it is, but it's not balloons. And, and here's an interesting uh, topic that I, I talked uh, a little bit about uh, with uh, Santa Friedman, and he didn't get into too much detail, but what about time travel from your uh, information and uh, interviews? Do these particular people feel that it's true and, and possible? I know quantum physics, uh, they said, yes, it is. It is very possible, but, uh, you know, a theory from factuality is totally different. Uh, have you come across anybody that does uh, believe fully into time travel? Absolutely, absolutely. It's one of the most fascinating. In my second book, How Do You Speak to a Ball of Light, I have two interviews about time travel. One, Al Bielik, the, Mo the Montauk Project or the Philadelphia Experiment. Yep. You want to go there? That is so weird. And uh, he's got so much support for that. And the second one that I talk about time travel is uh, is the um, the Dan Bursch story. Uh, the Dan Bursch was a microbiologist who worked with a a being in uh, he said at S4 in the Area 51 facility who said he was us from the future. <laughs> now you want to so we had had a nuclear disaster and that those. He, uh, Dan is, was involved in trying to find some way of curing a, an illness he had that, that caused him to have problems with his skin. And uh, he said he was a regular person. He had children, and he came from somewhere else. And he said we had already had this nuclear disaster, that we are on parallel timelines, that we could go one way or another. You, if you want to mentally go there, that is really hard to swallow. Uh, you know, parallel timelines. And yeah. then the Rendlesham Forest case. I mean, Larry Warren told me, and he put it out there, he's put it out there, that a mental message was sent to the beings, you know, who are you? And they repeated, we are you from the future. So you know, if they're us from the future, where in the world did we end up? And uh, can we change the future? And, and, and it's, you know, it's kind of cool because if, if they're doing it so that we won't have that future, then the future is not cast in stone. Like the Greeks believed in destiny. Maybe we can change it, and, and that would be wonderful. Colonel Corso did tell me they had discovered a time machine, but he didn't mean it that way. He didn't mean you go into a machine and, you know, and, and the time, it, it is a time-traveling machine. He, I think he meant that, that, that there was a way of going back and forth in time through telepathy or whatever you go to where you can see future events or past events. And I think that's what he was talking about. And I think there are whole uh, communities of scientists that are working on this in the back room. See, these are not something. These are not something that common people know about. It's not something that's talked about, I think, publicly. But I think, yeah, I believe there's time travel. I believe... In the back room, somebody's working on this. I, I think they, you know, just looking at the whole Philadelphia experiment, uh, looking at a lot of things that have happened, uh, maybe there are parallel timelines. Would that uh, be a, a basic training for remote viewing as well? Because uh, that... Uh... Yeah. You're right. No, you're right. There, there, it, it goes into the remote viewing thing, but see... In my first book, I talk about that. At the very last, I talk about paranormal factor, because I was I'm very good friends with Russell Targ, who and, and Hal Putoff, and those guys who did the uh, the uh, the SRI experiments, the the Ingo Swan, the the um, uh, you know the remote viewing, for for reasons of military applications, you know, uh, you know psychic spying. Well, if we all can do this stuff. It should be normal. It shouldn't just be for psychic spying. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, you brought up remote viewing. It's so important to study that. I think that's, and I've, I've listed two or three books there, too. Well, I, <laughs> the, the whole aspect of it, just it's fascinating. I, I mean, what could we do to really, you know, 
uh, instilled this uh, in the mass consciousness and the mass public. Uh, would would you know uh, maybe bringing it down a notch and making kind of like a, a Hollywood commercial movie in sort of like a, a lollipop way make it better? Would you say, or or just continue on this this path? I think you should do it in schools. I think you should teach telepathy in schools. I think you should teach remote viewing. I, you know, you could find your car keys. Mm-hmm. You could you could trust your feelings, your gut instincts. You you get yourself out of trouble. Uh, you know, using ESP would would help so many people. You could cure yourself. You could heal yourself. You could. I mean, there's there's so many things. If we took this seriously, if we were get off of our Western, you know, taboos, I think it would be wonderful. Uh, we could start with our kids. It would really be fascinating to to see, uh, especially too with the connectivity uh, and uh, the almost uh, you know constant need for this generation to to use their uh, cellular phones, texting, uh, iPods, MP3 players. You know, <laughs> I think they're so in tune with negativity and uh, unfortunate uh, mind distractions that. That, to me, is a huge challenge. Uh, I think uh, we need to power down, in other words. No, it is a challenge, and I like you to, I like that word you used. You didn't make it too negative by saying it's a challenge, because with a challenge you can try to beat it. And, yeah, and I'll tell you, uh, it's dangerous. I think all of the microwaves, everything we're dealing with, makes us more machines than they make us human. And it is dangerous. We can exaggerate. We can have no life at all if we... If we bond with our machines, and uh, but but maybe that's part of it too. Maybe that's this is a civilization that will go down the tubes because it bonded with machinery. Uh, you know, maybe this is on one timeline. It, I could see a science fiction story here, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, maybe that's what Terminator uh, was uh, implying. You know, that it wasn't so much a cybernetic machine, but just a, a you know a robotic human uh, <laughs> that wanted to destroy. Uh, a, a pure human, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Antonio, is, uh, you know, untainted, kind of innocent, and uh, just let the machine dominate. You know, and, uh, well, I think if there's going to be contact, it's going to be with the pure humans. I think I think whoever's out there will probably pick the person that's in the farm somewhere that is not all machine-bound, that, right. that it can look up in the sky, that can see the stars at night. They'll, they'll pick people like that. They certainly won't pick people hooked up to machines. It, it, it's such an interesting area, Jason. I just hope that your listeners, whoever they are, get interested in it because it's it's it really is probably the most interesting and the most important thing we have uh, to to study on this planet. Absolutely, and uh, we don't want to become like the Borg. You know, and uh, we need to keep free thought, and uh, that's something that makes us human. I think is, is the ability to communicate and share ideas and grow uh, and see. You know, as you just said uh, not too long ago, into the future, into the past, into the present. You know, and and really try to make the better of the world. And uh, I, this might sound like a paid service announcement, but uh, it really is not. It is not. You know, I, I want to see us succeed as a species, uh, and I know you do that as well. Yeah, I do as well. And the fact that you can actually verbalize it and say it is the first step towards doing it. I mean, you need to say it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, uh, I, I know uh, we've uh, gone over an extended uh, amount of time, and I, I really appreciate that as well because, you know, I, I, as I said at the beginning of the show, I, I am so almost starstruck for the fact that I get to speak to people such as yourself, and I am extremely grateful. And uh, I don't think I could ever, you know, say it in enough words how much I appreciate that you came on my my tiny little show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're all doing the same thing. We're all in, on the same path. We're all in it together. Uh, and so I, it was an honor, and just keep doing a good job and, and, and make sure that you publicize it and, and more people will listen, and, and it, it, you know, it's, it's education. I, I really appreciate that, and uh, if at all in the future, if you want to come back on, uh, please let me know, and uh, 
within a minute, I, I will set it up and, and have you back because you've been absolutely wonderful. Okay, you take care. It's been fun. You take care. Thank you. Have a great night. All right, bye. Bye-bye. What a fantastic guest, uh, Paula Harris. Uh, please visit her website, paulaharris.com, and uh, take a look at all her great links, her books, and uh, material and resources and videos that she has posted. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, I absolutely did. And uh, I would love to have her back in the future without any hesitation. You know, and uh, for everyone out there that uh, is listening to the extended show, thank you for hanging on. Or if you're hearing it in archive, uh, I appreciate it. And I want to give a, a shout out to the Facebook group, YouTube page, MySpace, Twitter, and here on Blog Talk Radio. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, I'll see you on the other side, uh, which my next show will be on August 12th. And I hope you can join me then as well. Uh, Not too long, three days away. And uh, it will be with Amy Williamson from Paris Green Radio. Uh, We're going to talk everything that we can about the paranormal. So hope you can tune in. And uh, until then, I'll see you then. Have a great night. Tired of chaotic business travel bookings? Corporate Traveler has your back. With over 30 years of experience, unmatched service, and 24-7 support, we'll help you take the hassle out of business travel management. Plus, tap into exclusive corporate rates to keep your costs down. No more last-minute change headaches or cost surprises. Just smooth, efficient business travel experiences. Visit corporatetraveler.ca and discover refreshing business travel the Corporate Traveler way.